My name is Patrick Sherman. Uh, I direct the Independent School Leadership Master's Degree Program at Vanderbilt University. Uh, and I am joined today by four colleagues from Franklin Road Academy in Nashville, Tennessee. What the, what the five of us are going to talk to you about today um, is, is something that we feel kind of bridges the worlds between theory and practice. Uh, it's an aspect of the uh, Independent School Leadership Master's Degree program, but it's something that is, is turning into a great way of thinking about cultivating leaders and doing professional development within schools. And we're going to each share with you a little bit about that process from our uh, perspectives, right? And so it, it's easy to think about professional development as something that we kind of go out of our schools and do and then come back and try to implement. But this is really an embedded model of leadership, identification, cultivation, and development that has great benefits not only for the individuals, but also for the schools. And we're going to, again, talk to you about that from multiple perspectives today. <coughs> so uh, again, we'd like to think when we go to university courses or go out to, and hear great uh, theoretically based professional development, that that's just going to translate uh, right into improved practice. But uh, unfortunately, that bridge just really doesn't uh, exist. Um, and it really puts all of the work on the individual to come back and do that translational work. And so what we've thought about at, uh, at Vanderbilt is how do we develop programs and embed experiences that really bring kind of the real challenges of practice together with folks who have knowledge uh, and deep expertise through a set of school year activities. Right? And so this is something that we try to embed within our programs, but the component that we're going to talk about is something that you could implement in your own campuses. And so as we think about traditional coursework all the way over to these authentic uh, immersive activities that get at the heart of uh, true transfer of knowledge into practice, this is on that far end of that spectrum. So at Vanderbilt, we're always trying to kind of go to the right side of the continuum, because that's where you get kind of this transfer of learning and this really deep uh, embedded knowledge that you carry with you uh, into your career. So what I'm going to do um, just for a few minutes is, is provide an overview of kind of the tenets of high quality professional development. And before I go through these, and there are eight of them, I want you to just take a minute and, and think to yourself about an experience, a professional development experience that you've been to that you thought was really uh, highly impactful and meaningful to you. So kind of call that to your mind, one of those experiences that um, you feel was really beneficial to you personally and professionally uh, in your life. And then as I go through these, you can think about the extent to which these, um, these experiences that you've had are aligned with what the research tells us have the greatest impact on performance. Uh, and so these eight elements of effective professional development have really solid, uh, comprehensive, empirical validation uh, of elements of effective PD that actually impact people's practices and push teacher and student performance forward. Uh, so the first is include subject matter content. And really what this tells us is targeted professional development is the best um, because you've got to be anchored in something very specific concrete and subject matter and subject matter expertise are key in uh, effective professional development. Second, it's got to be job embedded, okay? And so the, the, the graphic before with the bridge crumbling, okay, is why a lot of PD, why it might be great and fun in the moment, doesn't have a sustained impact is because that job embedded link is so difficult. So we've got to think about ways of pushing the PD into the actual context where that knowledge could impact uh, practice. The third here is actually the one that has the highest degree of, of impact uh, on, uh, on performance. And it, it might be counterintuitive because it's not essentially the active part, it's the reflective part. But for PD to really have an impact, pack a punch, the individual has to do this important work of reflection on their beliefs and practices. And this is something that really helps push practice forward. 
Authentic active learning uh, is another key component. Uh, learning isn't static. And again, if we're requiring the person to kind of take an intellectual conversation and do the work, the translation work themselves, that's difficult. So the activity itself should incorporate some of uh, the actual uh, demonstration of that expertise uh, in the field. Um, collaboration with colleagues is another key thing. When we developed the model for the, our Independent School Leadership Institute, of which several of you are alumni of, uh, the early version said, you know, it's not going to be for individuals from schools, it's going to be for groups from schools, okay? Because collaboration uh, can really exponentially enhance the impact of an experience. Ongoing and sustained, um, the, the you know, one-shot deals, we all know uh, that that has a limited impact uh, on, uh, uh, on our careers, on our development, but the developmental experience, if it is over time, over a semester or school year, as you're here about the two models that we implement, um, it is something that ensures that that learning is really embedded. Uh, and then the, the final two, got to think about the support structure for um, learning. Um, you can't just kind of set up these high expectations for growth without really thinking through the types of supports required to really facilitate that work meaningful. Uh, and support isn't, you know, just financial resources. It can be access to time, time with the head of the school, the dean of faculty. Are these key supports that really ensure these uh, are effective ex experiences? And then finally, link to key learning outcomes. Um, you've got to have, uh, you kind of start with the end in mind, right, like learning theory tells us. And so you've got to have a goal that the activity is uh, attached to, something meaningful to really help focus and drive the work. So we have tried to incorporate these eight elements of effective professional development into the Independent School Leadership Master's program at Vanderbilt. And these are five key components of the program that kind of help us to weave those elements through it. And it's really this fifth uh, aspect of the program, the incorporation of these uh, school year activities that we're gonna spend time with you now discussing. Um, the program is such that you come to Vanderbilt for an intensive six week summer one experience, then you return to your home school for the school year and you're given a set of practical application projects, two to work on in the fall, two in the spring, and then you return for a second summer. And it's that school year work and two models that we've used uh, that we're now going to talk to you a bit in, in detail as models for your own faculty's development. Before you hear from our two students and those two models, though, we're gonna hear from now John Murray kind of linking uh, what we're finding uh, about that experience um, to, to ways you can think about it in, in your own school. So with this, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Patrick. So, um, so what I want to talk about is so, um, you know, he's kind of framed the program and, and, and framed kind of what the research-based principles of effective PD are. What I want to talk about is what does that look like practically in a school? So um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is connected directly to this program, but I think uh, the principles apply to you know, what does effective PD look like um, in a school and what are some of the important things to consider uh, when you're taking a look at, at PD. Because I think you know, effective PD is all about um, improving things in your school. So that could be improving teaching, it could be improving some other aspect of the school. Um, but um, that's the goal of it. So we want to make sure that we, we kind of understand what are the main things we need to consider as we're doing that. So, um, so I wanted to kind of start with these couple of quotes because, again, even though we're talking about developing leaders and effective PD in schools to develop leaders, um, I just love these quotes because they really remind us what effective PD is supposed to be all about. We've all, you know, Patrick asked all of you to think about what does the best PD I've ever experienced look like. Um, remember what all the ineffective ones may look like on the other end of that, right? And, um, and you can think about, unfortunately, we've all sat through a lot of wasted time and we've, we've all invested time and money in our schools and ourselves in PD that didn't result in any improvement in our schools. And that's really a sad thing. We wanna make sure that it's resulting in improvement. So um, Linda Darling-Hammond, who many of you may be aware of, a Stanford University professor, 
probably the leading researcher in this area for years and years, and I just, again, love this quote. Unfortunately, when we design PD often, we forget some of the principles that we learned as teachers about how to set up effective learning environments. And so um, when Patrick was talking about those eight principles of effective professional learning, and when I'm talking about what that actually looks like in a school setting, these are all connected to what are sound learning principles that as teachers, we all started off as we were thinking about designing effective lessons for our kids. And then this next one, some of you may uh, remember a gentleman named David Mallory who worked for years and years in independent schools, uh, primarily in the Northeast. A uh, wonderful gentleman, ran a lot of seminars um, for teachers, and I, I love this one too. If we want our students to be lifelong learners, of course, we need to be lifelong learners. We need to be modeling the same things we want from our kids. And if we want to develop leaders within our schools and, and want to try and foster their development, well, as the leaders who are trying to foster future leaders, we need to make sure we're doing a lot of those things as well. So I wanted to set the stage by having those couple of pieces up. So I'm going to talk about seven um, different um, kind of applications for what this looks like in schools. So um, number one is to make sure that as you're taking a look at um, what types of projects a future school leader might do or just in general what type of PD you're going to embark on um, to make sure that you're wrestling with real issues and, and working to generate real solutions. Um, and this means up front taking a look at what does the strategic plan at your school say about what are the main things that your school is going to be working on as a school, right? What are the leadership initiatives that are in place school-wide, and what is your mission? And making sure that as you're working with uh, future school leaders, as you're designing professional development, that you're looking for things that connect to all three of those connect to the strategic plan, connect to the needs of the school, and are furthering the mission of the school at the same time. I think often we don't pay enough attention to those type of things up front. Number two, and as Patrick indicated, this is a principle we all know about regarding effective teaching, making sure that once we've identified what those goals are, and we've connected them to the mission, the strategic plan, that we specify exactly what we want to accomplish with the PD that we set criteria up in advance to know whether or not we're going to be successful, that we've set up ways to assess whether or not we're going to be successful up front, and that we plan for checkpoints along the way. One of the things you're going to hear about when Rod and Jay talk about their stories is they're going to talk about up front how clear it was in terms of what they were trying to accomplish, and a lot of this is because um, Sean really pushed them to do that, um, and then they're going to talk about checkpoints along the way to make sure that they were making progress and that there could be adjustments and flexibility in terms of trying to accomplish those things. Um, three and four. Um, Jay and Rod are the perfect candidates for this because they meet these criteria. Extraordinarily self-directed. Uh, they're really seeking leadership um, responsibilities. Highly, highly motivated. So if, you're, if you're looking to um, hand off or or help um, you know, set future leaders on a course to solve some school problems, this isn't going to work with everybody is the key point. Right? For people that this is going to work with, they really have to have um, these um, characteristics. Uh, number four, and Sean will probably talk a little bit more about this um, when he gets um, his uh, uh, time up here. Um, one of the things that um, Sean mentioned to both Jay and Rob when they came with their proposals for the ideas they had about their products was, Listen, I don't want this to be adding to my to-do list. I want this to be taking things off of my to-do list. And so um, we want, wanted this from the outset to be um, making sure that we were solving um, issues in our school, improving our school, not adding a bunch of extra things to do, which, of course, is why the self-directed, highly motivated piece for number three is so important. So it's certainly important to, to make some connections, to open doors, to support individuals as they're learning to grow in this area and as they're um, kind of setting out to um, solve a particular school problem as they're starting a project. But then, um, you know, it's just not possible to hold their hand the entire way, right? You want to let them go and let them uh, work on solving the problem and check in periodically, um, provide support, and make sure that the things are on the right track. But the focus has got to be on reducing to-do lists, right? Solving problems taking things off of the desk of higher leadership, not, uh, not the reverse. Um, number five, and this is a key piece too, that this isn't going to work if a culture isn't in place 
where a self-starter and somebody who's independent and somebody who uh, wants to have discussions about potential problems that may exist at the school, if there isn't a culture that welcomes that kind of dialogue and welcomes um, growing people, um, then this isn't going to work. So it's important to attend to a culture that really fosters that growth mindset, not just with kids, but with adults as well, that really does celebrate teachers and uh, future school leaders trying things and recognizing it may not always work, right? We want our students to fail for, we want them to have appropriate intellectual risk taking. Well, we, we have to understand that mistakes may be made as we're developing this, um, but we want to encourage that because that's the only way we're going to solve school problems and that's the only way we're going to get better at what we do. So it's important to make sure that that culture is built. Um, number six, and this goes with all PD as well, um, we certainly want you know, um, school leaders like Jay and Rod to develop their content knowledge about a particular thing. And you're going to hear about their two projects where they certainly learned about the content related to those projects, but equally and perhaps more important is them learning about the political and interpersonal realities of taking a project and getting it to an endpoint and actually solving a real problem in a school. And I'm sure they could both talk about that they learned a ton about that. What do I, how do I approach this person? How do I make sure I get this done? How do I make sure that um, I navigate this particular difficulty that emerged? That's a lot of what school leadership is all about. And the only way to get there is to learn how to wrestle with and manage those types of realities. So this is a really important piece of this program. And I would say that you know, they probably learn as much about this as anything else. And then the last one is making sure to, um, again, begin with the end in mind and think about uh, all the potential things that are going to be needed to get to that endpoint. What type of resources are you going to need available to support the person in trying to make sure that they get that project done? In terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of people, whatever those pieces are, so that we're making sure we're setting them up to be successful and not setting them up to run into some type of roadblock down the road. So um, we do have a sheet for um, when you leave that are going to summarize um, these kind of seven key takeaways and how they're connected to the principles Patrick talked about. I'm going to turn things over to Rod right now to talk about his experience. Thank you, Rod. At the end of my first year of a part of the independent school leadership program at Vanderbilt, we were given very specific ways to uh, go about action research in our school. Uh, Dr. Quentin Walker, a graduate of the EDD program from Vanderbilt, came in and gave an actual application of how to go about researching, writing, and doing action research change within a school. Um, and so that was the step that I took for the entire year and then came back the second year to present it and talk about it. In the second week of school, we had the pleasure of having Dr. Joseph Murphy uh, come in and speak to our class. And at the very beginning, he, he's a big writer in academics, uh, a lot of work out there, but he talked about uh, a famous term that we sort of use a lot uh, within my cohort called FedEx receipts. And he basically talked about how schools continuously buy package change, and over the years, it fills our closets, uh, and we have the receipts to show, here's the way we went about this change, but is the school really changing? And it really set off for our group a moment where we thought, if we're going to do change in school, how and what we go after is really important. There are all these things that people do every year uh, in and out. And they are great improvements for the school. But when we're talking about sustained change, things that really shape your academies, uh, we really sort of backed Dr. Murphy here and believed in it. And I remember. He presented this concept and we had to go work in groups and come back and present two ideas, just two. He's like, if you're a school and you're ahead, what are your two ideas to change a school? What are, and it's not a strategic plan, it's not accreditation, it's none of these things. It's just a focus on what you can do and how to get it accomplished. Um, let's see here. So the three purposes of Action research, are of course, to uh, create for me, in a sense, a, reflect, a, a reflective practitioner, making progress on school-wide priorities, and building professional cultures. To be fair, this was really designed a lot for me. You know, this is something that 
was put into uh, my way of working and to sort of build in me all these changes. But because of the openness of Sean and the school, um, I was able to go after something that really did shape me as a, as a leader and learning more and more. So the thing that was taught to us, this is the six steps of action research. A lot, there's a, part of this is individual, where I'm, I'm, I'm with myself, I'm thinking about this stuff, I'm doing the action research, I'm writing things for Patrick and my classes, uh, and then part of it is meeting with school leaders and groups. And I'm gonna talk about, once we get to part five here in a second, but I would say the first uh, semester was part one through four, okay? Um, so I'm creating, I'm, I'm thinking about the issue, I'm writing it down, I'm thinking about the challenges, I'm meeting with people to select within the issue what that is and identify it, I'm analyzing it within the school and what the need is for it, I'm going out and I'm reading uh, journals and uh, independent school uh, magazine and I'm trying to find as much research on this topic as I possibly can to see what other schools have done, what have they not done, what's the current research versus 10 years ago, all these sort of things. My, my original plan was a very big overlook at admissions data. So I'm, I'm looking at FRA, I'm looking at what we had done for years, I'm thinking about what could we do to improve, all these sort of ideas. And this is, you know, I had conversations with my upper school head uh, and the admissions department. And then I went and talked to Sean, and this is very, and I'm so thankful for this. His point was, you're, you're doing something too big. And he ended up having something that still had to do with, in the end, my research project had to do with collecting data and how could our school use data in a better way. That was, in the end, my thesis. How could FRA as a school use data in a better way? And he said, I'm glad that you're learning all this admission stuff. This is going to be great for you in the end. But I have this other project over here that deals with data on school busing and creating a bus route for our students. And I want you to look at this data, and I want you to come up with what you think about it, and I want you to present it to the board. And I ended up changing in the midst of my own action research. I went from a very large umbrella focus to as he would say, you could help me take a little bit of work off my desk, and that's what I ended up studying. And I did, I ended up going back over parts one through four again, looking at this specific question and uh, challenge, and then creating a situation where we ended up designing one bus route, which in the next year has moved to a second bus route, uh, and all the different points in between. But that, and what I think was really interesting was, I wasn't the only one who had to change my uh, original idea. So several in my cohort started with one concept and then in the midst of their action research came up with maybe this is the real situation that we need to tweak or work on or whatever right now and that became our focus and it ended up helping the school. Um, so that is what I ended up doing. Uh, in a, it's created a positive change Within my school, like I said, it ended up, we started with one bus route going into South Nashville. We now have a new route going into West Nashville. Um, but along the way, my action research process, which again, is a little bit different than Jay's, um, these three things, create positive change in my school, continue to improve our school communities, and develop our capabilities, uh, capacities, and sk skills as school leaders. Something that another head of school uh, said to us was, what are you focused on? You know, we, Jay and I are two people who are, in a, are growing as leaders, trying to grow as leaders, but the question became, are we trying to grow as leaders more than we're trying to grow our school? And we are two people who are committed to FRA and want the school to grow. Because we're focused on that, our leadership is growing as well. And we think that that's a really positive thing that came from this. So this is Jay Salado with his approach. Well, I am very excited uh, to be here and to be speaking with you guys. When Patrick asked me, it was a no-brainer for me. These are uh, two of my favorite schools, uh, probably my two favorite schools in the world, Vanderbilt University and Franklin Road Academy. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm an alumnus of both. Um, and so I want to go back to Rod's last slide. Uh, this was unplanned, but 
um, I think it's definitely worth noting the order in which he uh, listed these bullet points and the fact that um, developing our own capacities and the leadership development uh, is last. Uh, it's not first and foremost. Um, what I would say is that that's key. And Dr. Murray said you're selecting the right individuals. Make sure you select individuals that are committed to your school, that aren't going to do this to uh, take your school's secrets elsewhere, uh, so to speak, uh, but to make your school a better place. And so that's, that's important uh, for me. Like I said, um, I, I love the school uh, and, and really want to develop the school. Um, and all of the leadership development is just a bonus uh, for me. Um, also, following Rod uh, is a tough task, uh, but following Rod in this program was fantastic for me. Uh, being the Bravo class, or, or the 2.0, uh, allowed us to make some changes. Um, it's not to say that one approach is better than another. Uh, that's why we're giving you guys two approaches today, uh, that you can choose what's best for your school and what's best for the mission of your school. Uh, but I certainly think that uh, the action research approach, the practical application project approach that I'm about to describe uh, was great for me and I hope great for our school. Um, also, it's really key, I don't know how many heads of school are in the audience today, but um, having the support of Sean uh, was integral. Um, I did not run into a closed door in all of my interviews and in all of my research, um, and I don't know how much of that was, was him, uh, but I'll show you kind of my list of interviews, and uh, these are busy people. As you guys know in your schools, you are busy people. Uh, and so for these people to give me some of their time uh, was very generous. Um, also, Patrick having the check-ins. Uh, as a part of our program, uh, in the first summer, you go through five themes. And there's teachers and teaching, there is admissions, advancement, community development, and action research. And so you take four of those themes and you do an action research project on each. And so I'll go through those in a minute. I don't wanna get into the weeds uh, and um, maybe bore you uh, with the details about Franklin Road Academy. While it is a great school, you are all at different schools. And so I know that the missions uh, are different, uh, the problems are different, we'll call them opportunities. The opportunities are different uh, for, uh, for change. And so I'm gonna focus on the process. Um, my first practical application project uh, was about teachers and teaching. And so um, I asked the question, what is ambitious teaching? And so that was the term uh, that I threw out there. I interviewed department chairs, grade chairs, all of the senior leadership, and I kept coming back to this phrase, which was going above and beyond. Teachers that go above and beyond, I thought, to infinity and beyond. And then I thought, what makes Toy Story great is that it's not a bunch of Buzz Lightyears, and what makes our faculty great is that it's not the same teacher. And so whatever it means to go above and beyond uh, is different for each teacher. Um, Sean gave us a lot of nuggets, both the alphas and the bravos, and you've heard about it. Uh, you want to make your boss's job easier. Okay, it doesn't matter who gets the credit, um, but uh, this uh, was a huge, huge deal to me. So I went back to the division heads and I said, what can your teachers do to make your job easier? Um, and so my first practical application project dealt with probably the most important aspect of our schools, which is teachers and teaching. Um, it was really, uh, it opened my eyes uh, to uh, talk to a kindergarten teacher uh, one hour and then talk to an AP US teacher the next hour um, and see how uh, similar actually their ideas of ambitious teaching were. The second practical application project was on admissions. And so rather than go to admissions with my idea of what I thought they should do, uh, I went in the door and spoke with them and I said, what is a problem that you would like me to help solve. And we had actually just had our first open house. We do one in the fall and one in the spring, as I'm sure many of you guys do. And they said, I think we could do a better job with open house. Would you mind looking into that and seeing what we uh, need to do to improve? And so I compare it to the Super Bowl. So this is what they 
prepare for all year. And so a couple of elements that the Super Bowl and the uh, open house have in common is that everyone knows the time, date, and location. And so this fall, I feel like we've done a much better job of canvassing the Nashville community and making sure everybody knows uh, the date and the time. It doesn't compete with other events. Uh, as much as possible, researching other schools, open houses, uh, and other major events. Uh, it's the culmination of weeks and months of preparation. And so um, there's excitement, uh, but no panic on the day of the event. So you're not running around and still getting things ready. A lot of these are common sense and maybe things that you do, but things that maybe I noticed last fall were things we could work on. Players and coaches are prepared. In this case, students and teachers. Our open house is on a Sunday, so classes are not in session. Uh, but uh, you only get so much of a sense of a school by talking to teachers and administrators. I think you really need to see the students. And not necessarily canned answers on a panel, uh, but the students being asked real questions and giving real answers. And so we've really beefed up our student ambassador program, uh, and they're a big part of open house. Um, and so it's about the players, not the coaches. It's about the students, not the teachers. I think that's who sells our schools. And so that was a part of my second practical application project. I'm excited uh, on November 6th uh, to uh, get our open house for the fall uh, and see how those changes have been implemented. I'm not gonna delve too much into the financials of our school, um, which is probably a relief uh, to, to some. Um, because you have to understand the political and interpersonal realities, uh, as uh, Dr. Murray said. Um, but uh, this was an area where I was completely in the dark before. And so in the area of advancement, um, I was able to delve into our strategic plan. Um, and so for me, I don't know if I necessarily made any changes, uh, but for me, that was a great area of growth uh, in, in my leadership uh, development. And then showing that every uh, seed you plant necessarily is not immediately watered, uh, but the advantage of having four practical application projects is that one of them might take hold. Like Rod said, uh, you can't make all the changes at once or else you'll have a box of FedEx receipts. Um, and so four practical application projects, if one makes sustained change in a school, then it's worth it, in my opinion. Um, and so the Mutually Beneficial Community Partnership uh, I started looking at a high school university partnership, and so I looked at the mission statement of our school. I looked at the mission statement of Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I found that they were fairly similar. Uh, focus on service uh, and Christian leadership and uh, integrity. You're seeing a lot of the same words up here on the screen, and so one of my recommendations was that uh, we reach out. It's not necessarily across the street, uh, like Vanderbilt University and University School of Nashville, or even on the same campus like Lipscomb Academy and Lipscomb University, but um, it's a school in Nashville where we share the same mission. And so while we haven't uh, made great strides in that area yet, uh, I have no doubt that um, we may down the road. So um, like I alluded to earlier, uh, these were just a few of the people that I interviewed. Um, and. I would encourage you, especially if you're ahead of school, um, to make everyone aware uh, that this is happening. It makes it a lot easier uh, to schedule these interviews. It made it a lot easier for me that Rod had done uh, a similar project the year before. And so, like I said, I didn't run into a lot of resistance. Um, I developed as a leader, but hopefully, uh, and more importantly, the school uh, was developed as well. So I'll turn it over to uh, Sean Casey, our head of school. Just in wrapping up, I just have one slide. <clears throat> I walked into this. I walked in a couple of years ago. And the things I would encourage you to think about is what business are we in? It's kind of funny. We talk about kind of learning and all those things. And then we show up to these conferences and we do it like this. We put these in big table barriers and we walk around with a PowerPoint up here. It's about as bad as we can think about education. If our teachers ran classes like this, we would be saying, go teach someplace else. So I'm going to walk up here a little bit. <clears throat> at least interact. So we talk about what are we in the business of doing? We are in the people growing business. That's what we do. Not just the kid growing business, we are in the people growing business. And if we're not doing that, then we're failing miserably as leaders. And as Jay showed you our mission, one of the words in our mission is leadership, growing leaders. And we probably, most of our schools have something like that in there. Uh, but yet what we do is schools are very proprietary, right? 
I have my admissions office, people have this area, and my other people have this area, and nobody really wants to share information. Even as school leaders, nobody really wants to share a whole lot of information unless it's good, right? Nobody wants to, sh you know, you come to a conference and everybody finally says, well, lower school enrollment is down, and everybody goes, ah, oh, you too, right? And, and, and then they say, it's across the country, and everybody goes, oh, other than like the west side of Manhattan and Buckhead and a few other places, everybody feels the same thing going on. So, you know, but part of it is having real conversations. So when these guys came into my office, uh, the job is how do I help them grow? Because my job is I want them to have my job someday. You know, if I'm doing my job well, is I'm trying to grow people in our organization. And as John outlined here, you know, thinking about real issues, you know, I asked them, Rod came into my office, and we all have these people in our school. They're gung-ho, uh, and I was the exact same way, and everybody thinks you can solve every problem, right? You know, from the back of every faculty meeting, we've decided we can solve every issue until we're in the seat that we have to solve the issue. And we realize how much more complicated it is in terms of navigating through the school. And so the greatest lesson that I could give them is figuring out that getting it through a school is a lot harder than you realize, than sitting in the back of the room saying, oh, if we just did this, everything would work out fine. But the reality is, wait a second, I have to work with constituencies. I have to work with hard feelings. I have to work with real people who, you know, when Rod came in and said, I want to talk to the admissions people, well, you know that's going to step on some people's toes because that's their full-time job. And so how do we help you navigate it? Part of it is telling my admissions people, like, relax. He's not here to take your job. He's here to make us better and make your job easier. And that was one of the things I asked these guys to do was make people's jobs easier. Solve problems. As I came up through a school, I did lots of different jobs. I worked in a boarding school for 17 years. I did five different jobs. My goal, when I reported to the head of school, my goal was to not put things on my head's desk. It was to take things off of them. And trying to teach my people that that's their job, is to identify what are the bigger, and the really, I said, if you want to take things off my desk, go look at our strategic plan and see what's in our strategic plan and then work backwards into areas that you can contribute to it. And I think those are things, so somebody here might say like, Rod started a transportation route for us, and you'd say, well, we already have that in our school. Well, I don't care, we didn't have it in my school. <laughs> That's a problem I had to solve, not a problem you had to solve. Uh, you may have something else in your school. And so, you know, asking them to figure out what are the things that we need to get done. Uh, and so they, they did a great job in that. And the second thing was trying to give them um, goals and also, you know, talk about finding the right people. Not everybody in my school could handle this. Not everybody in my school, I could hand them something, but trying to identify people that they, could, they wanted to make a difference and they wanted to grow. Um, you know, they said opening doors and clearing desks. Yeah, I had to kind of open, I had to start to establish a culture at our school that says, this is okay. When somebody comes to interview you about our numbers, when they go meet with our business, or our chief of financial officer about the numbers, and, I'm, and Jay, I'm like, and I had to sit down with Jay and go, Jay, you understand why this is so proprietary? You know, wh who is going to see this? You know, I gotta build trust with him, and he, he's gotta know I trust him, but he's also gotta know that this is not going to end up at a presentation in Vanderbilt when every other competitor in town <laughs> has a, somebody else in the program. And so, you know, we had to talk through those things very candidly, uh, and once again, it talks about kind of, you know, building trust, but also understanding what are realistic outcomes? What are we trying to accomplish? You know, I didn't want them chasing down projects Oh great, you came up with a great idea that will cost us $1.2 million. That doesn't help us. Um, you've come up with a project, so you know, the solutions, you know, one of the things that you know, Jay worked on from one of his programs you know, was some professional development work that our teacher do in terms of teacher growing, working together. You know, Rod, you know, we have 22 kids riding a bus that, you know, well clearly we had a need. We had another seven from a different area of town that hopped on a bus that you know, he discovered where the route was, where we should pick them up. He solved the problem, but he also solved the problem for our admission team that when I walked in the door, they were asking me, I want to do this, but they don't have enough time to figure out what's the right place to do. And so I share that with you because I think it goes beyond just kind of this program, but it goes to schools. Uh, and when you think about what we're trying to accomplish, you know, we all have schools, we all have challenges in our places. We all have, everybody's maxed out. But there's also a group of people that are below the top that are trying to figure out how do I start to make, cut my teeth and how do I wake my, make my way up? And starting to identify projects for them to work on that allows them to say, and give them some autonomy, not say, hey, don't, don't do it the way I want it done. Go figure out the way it needs to be done and what's the best way to do it so that we can get to a solution. And I think it's interesting, when I spoke over at um, the class over in Patrick's class, the biggest level of consternation I sense in the room is always the question, when I pick my question, how am I gonna get this through my school? 
Like, who's going to be the roadblocks? Everybody wanted to know, who am I going to offend? You know, am I going to offend the admissions office? Am I going to offend the head of the upper school? Am I going to offend X, Y, or Z, the dean of academics? Who, that was, it says, you guys could probably correct me, that was the thing. And finally, I turned to them this summer and I said, do you guys understand, that's the project. That's the nature of schools. It's not whatever thing you decide to do, it's your ability to work through a community to bring about a resolution. That's what we're trying to get our people to be able to do as opposed to complain about it. Instead of, as opposed to the people who say, I don't like how this works, and they go off in the corner and complain to the five other people, they're trying to figure out, oh, how do we solve this and how do we do this? And you know, you, you know, these guys are a great job. You, know, you, you see in our school community, you know, it's been amazing. Our enrollment's grown by 10% over the last couple of years. Our net revenue has grown by the same amount each of the last couple of years. Our, our annual fund has grown by 61% in a couple of years, and it's a lot of because guys like this who are out in the community being proactive. I can't do those things, you know, from my seat. I have to have people that are around me that are going to do it. You know, I had a great mentor to me who told me, how am I going to grow my people? And so one of the things I did is I took our division heads, and each of our division heads sits on a committee of our board of trustees. And they rotate each year, so they get a chance to see what it really looks like behind the curtain. You know, so one year they sat on finance, and one year they sat on advancement. And my, I told them, I said, this is the three-year plan for how you grow. Because my job is eventually make them heads of school. My job is to make, you know, these guys into those roles. You know, that's the job. You know, John's been beneficial. He's already been a head of school. And so he, he, I'm just glad he's doing what he's doing now for us. Um, but the point being, like, how do we grow our people, you know, that want to grow? And how do we encourage other people uh, in the community to say, okay, you know, I, I want to take on a challenge. I want to take on a task. What are the projects? And even our, you know, other people saying, okay, we have a new project that we think about. Who do we give it to to say, can you run with this for a while and see what we can accomplish? So anyway, this has been, I walked into this, you know, in kind of when I walked in a couple years ago. Uh, and, you know, but I think part of, um, I hope it's been successful because I've tried to help it be successful instead of saying, well, how is this going to hurt? Who is this going to, we shouldn't do this because someone's going to be offended. Uh, and I think that's, quite honestly, that's what a lot of schools do, right? I mean, if we're really realistic about it, lots of school, nobody wants their toes hurt, nobody wants to talk candidly, uh, and so we just kind of keep going with the status quo, and people like this get really frustrated, and they move on. That's, that's really what happens in school, is our people who are runners get frustrated if we don't try to carve ways for them to run uh, and grow programs, and they go someplace else where they find they can run. Uh, so anyway, I, I hope that's helpful. But.